Well, good evening. I am Reverend Barbara Williams, and you are watching us. We are Unity of Chautauqua, and this is our Positive Path for Spiritual Living lecture. Um, so I just want to invite you to, that, to go to our website, and if you found us through our YouTube or anything, you can sign up and get our emails, and our website is unitychq.org. And also, if you're wondering about unity, go to unity.org and um, explore what unity has to offer. This evening, um, this, in fact, let me just say this, this has been an amazing week. This is, the whole week is about building a culture of empathy. And we are so delighted to add to that to the wonderful things that have been happening at Chautauqua, that we're doing that too here. And I have the Reverend Ron Neff and the Licensed Unity teacher, Amy Neff. And tonight, they're going to share on that very topic. So um, we are recording right now, but what we're going to do is after we record, we will have time for a discussion. So thank you for joining us. And now I'd like, I'm going to sit, sit over to the side and invite Ron and Amy to share with you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, watching this uh, program this evening, appreciate your being here with us. I think first I'd like to uh, give a few accolades to someone, Reverend Barbara Williams, who has taken over this project in the Unity of Chautauqua for the past now, what's it, this is the third season? Yeah. Yes, yes that you've been to. And certainly the last year and this year <laughs> with the all of the pandemic uh, situation that's been going on that, uh, I just say thank you, and we're just so delighted that you have been able to get through this and do it because it's much more than what we ever had to deal with mm -hmm. uh, summer to summer. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We are blessed. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, you know, so it's subject to this evening. I call it a lecture, I guess, but I really don't look at it too much of a lecture. I just like to speak my thoughts uh, to you about uh, the theme this week, which is, of course, uh, the culture of empathy. But uh, I also like to look at it from the standpoint of it's letting your light shine. And so my talk is kind of built around that. And uh, I'd like to begin with a quote from Deepak Chopra's book called The Third Jesus. And in it, he has a, what he calls Jesus and the self. And this is what he says. Jesus devoted many teachings to the subject of the self, meaning the bundle of aspects that we call me. In this bundle are wrapped the ego, the personality, and the soul. They're not neatly arranged into separate compartments, but they bleed confusingly into one another. Sometimes we feel close to the soul, sometimes far away. More often, we feel confused, unable to understand what the soul really is and what it wants. Jesus spent a great deal of time clarifying this confusion. He said, you do not understand me in support of a deeper truth. You do not know who you really are. And by telling people who they really are, he delineates a new kind of human being. One who accepts that being one with God is our natural higher state. All great spiritual teachers encourage change and the self is a vehicle for that change. Becoming new is just all an illusion unless the self you inhabit every day and recognize in the mirror starts to lose its old habits and conditioning. Wow. 
And, you know, with that, I decided to look into Charles Fillmore, our co-founder's revealing word, trying to find what perhaps the metaphysical term of light would be. Well, the understanding principle in mind is light. In divine order, it also comes first into our consciousness. Light is a symbol of wisdom. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12, he meant that he was an expresser of truth in all its aspects. Then as we know, he's quoted in John 14, 12, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Of course, he's referring to God. Well, Fillmore then goes on to identify inner light as the illumination of spirit resident in the center of man's being, and of course, women too. But then there's another more recent quote from a very famous American man. It's this. He said, more than any other time in history, mankind faces crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, and the other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Now, who do you think that was? I mean, quite a contrast. I think you'd all agree, kind of a nihilistic view of life, right? Well, that was Woody Allen. We all might surmise that would be the case, <laughs> reflecting the modern worldview that says we are nothing beyond our human biology and that life is essentially meaningless. Thank God, and literally, there's the opposite perspective of the law. And coming from unity especially, isn't that? Life is purposeful, and we are much more than only human. But you see, we in our modern world appear to be so deeply embraced and embedded in our human nature that the evidence that we are more than human is a whole lot more difficult to perceive. And that's what we could call maybe our human dilemma. We have very powerful internal forces that path and push us in opposite directions. We've got this survival instinct first, that's a drive to survive in physical form, which is overlaid by the drive to survive as a psychological entity. In other words, our individual ego. And that ego can be very often stronger than the one of physical survival. And yet within us, there is another very powerful drive. And that is the divine impulse to grow, to evolve, and to become more than we seem to be. And this drive is in every human being, even though we may not be consciously aware of it. However, with some humans, it has become conscious and very compelling. I like to simplify it, maybe even too much so, but it is letting your light so shine. You know, we often hear in Christian circles that everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die to get there. Or in New Age circles, paraphrased as everyone wants spiritual transformation, but no one wants to sacrifice their ego identity to attain it, you see. And I think you'd agree that facing the death of the body isn't easy, certainly not. But we all have to eventually face it. In the face of death of the ego, however, can sometimes be even more difficult. And so not many of us do so. You see, human beings will go to almost any length to preserve their identity. To lose it feels like death or worse sometimes. And yet human beings have also gone to incredible lengths to transcend their identity. The history of the human race is a fascinating drama about how we've played out these conflicting drives. And that conflict today is being felt more than ever before. Really, the tension between these two powerful forces is evident all over the world, caught between we could call beasts and angels, 
torn between safety, comfort, and security, and this indomitable force within us that demands that we call it higher, be more than what we are now. And that tension then is a part of the crisis, which is invoking us to give birth to a greater reality of who and what we really are. I love Pierre de Chardin's Evolution of Consciousness. It's a great book. And then, of course, he says we are all evolving from this humanness to spiritualness. And at some point in this long history of however long that might be, there comes a time when we are completely spiritual and there's no longer a need for the humanness of us. And he says that is when this humanness ends and something else begins. Who knows what that might be? And the good news, however, in all of this is that as we deepen our awareness of both of these forces, you see, the drive to maintain our present identity and a drive to evolve beyond it, we're in a better position to make this birth happen to us. The degree of conflict and suffering we may experience in this birthing process is a function of our understanding or our lack of it and our willingness to consciously embrace the evolutionary process of transformation. Now they're becoming more a reflection of our spiritual self. In unity, we call that we are spiritual beings having this human experience. Biblically said, to let your light so shine or keep it hidden under a bushel basket. Well, that theme this week, as you all know, building a culture of empathy, and it gives some real thought to this. And I thought about that for a long time and decided to go back to Phil Moore's revealing word thinking this would be maybe the ideal place to begin with his definition of empathy. Hmm, seemed to make sense to me, right? And guess what? Every other word is in there but empathy. And I thought, well, why is that? And I surmised that this maybe was because empathy is just one aspect of this inner light. So went to Webster's dictionary to find uh, some more description. And Harry had number one, the identification with an understanding of another situation, feelings and motives. And number two, the attribution of one's own feelings to an object. Again, simply to let our light shine or keep it under a hidden bushel basket. <laughs> Well, what then does letting your light so shine really mean? Well, our scientific definitions of light. One is that light is electromagnetic radiation. It has a wavelength in the range from about 3,900 to 7,700 angstroms, they call it. And it may be perceived by the unaided normal human eye. But then physics tells us that matter is nothing more than gravitationally trapped light or energy. And that light is the very essence of all substance, that everything in the universe is reducible to light. All matter, all substance, before manifesting in particular forms, such as trees or plants, etc., is pure light. Could that mean? Humans also. And most religions in the world consider light or enlightenment to be a spiritual awareness, an illumination maybe, a guiding spirit, a divine presence in each person. I mean, Jesus talked about that light within, didn't he? And I'm sure what he was implying here is that as the earth was waste and void until there was light, so is our consciousness waste and void until there is light. Maybe it's until we have an understanding that the Spirit of God within the depths of our being is moving us and guiding us in a right and very purposeful direction. And that the greatest need then and desire, even subconsciously, is the light, which represents illumination, intelligence, and wisdom. 
Jesus spoke the Amer 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 Aramaic, I get that correct, Aramaic language, and he used the word nura, nura. It's a word that means light, enlightenment, insight, brightness, brilliance, understanding. And to him, it was also symbolically represented God's word, true teaching, nura, nura. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In other words, he or she will have enlightenment and clear understanding. And in Matthew 5, 14, he then says, you are the light of the world. Later in that same chapter, he says, let your light so shine before others. I think you would agree that what he's trying to teach us here is let your enlightenment and your understanding of the truth be known to others how you act and you live your life. Well, how wonderful it would be when if all of us in this human family would feel a responsibility to let our love and compassion and goodness shine as a way of light to make the world around us a better place. Living in the Christ consciousness. Marianne Williamson, I really like a lot of her her thinking and her, her writings. She's a New Thought author and presenter. I'd like to quote from her personal story. She calls it, Believe in Yourself. And she said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't deserve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we conscious, unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. What a wonderful piece of writing. Believe in yourself. Another uh, New Thought author that I read and liked Nancy Mercurio, and she wrote a book entitled Escaping the Chaos Within. And she challenged us to be aware of three aspects of living life that will let our light shine brighter. That's what we're talking about this evening. What better time than today in this world that often appears in total disarray to look at the three aspects she has, and she explains. And I think the situation in our world today, you know what I'm talking about. First, she says, number one, we must believe in ourself. Just as Mary Ann Williamson was implying. Nancy talks about what a difficult time she had with believing in herself because she'd become so dependent on others all her life. But finally realizing what that was doing to her, she decided she could no longer live her life based on what others wanted for her. No longer allowing them to influence what she would choose for herself. She knew she had to develop a stronger sense of self-worth that had been lacking. She had spent the greater portion of her life believing more in others than in believing in herself. And she says through constant awareness of this and living from her inner source, she was able in time to increase confidence in herself and believe in herself. And secondly, she says you have to be yourself. Isn't it true that we constantly like to define ourselves in this country by what we do? Oh, I work for the school system. I'm a teacher. And we say, well, what do you do? And 
We ask people that all the time. And so we're known by what we do. Isn't that true? Not who we are. Ever had anyone ask you, well, who are you? And meaning, who are you really? Now we have all kinds of identities, don't we? Oh, I'm a hiker, I'm a gardener, I'm a homemaker, a wife, a husband, a traveler, a shopper. It goes on and on. It's almost like having to pull away the leaves of the artichoke in order to get to the heart. The very last thing we come to identify ourselves with is who we are as a human being, as a person in our heart. Nancy has a pretty neat exercise that she urges us all to do. It's kind of interesting. She says, go into your old photo albums. Not your iPhone. No, no, go back. iPhone's too recent. Go back further, you see. Pull out all those random photos of yourself from when you were a baby, through your childhood, to your teenagers, uh, you know, to then into college, perhaps, or, and then uh, as you move out of your teenage uh, life into uh, you know, your 20s and you maybe you're in college or go to school or you get a new job or you get it and so forth. And, and then keep going, just pull out all those random pictures of you in all the different aspects of your life. And then she says, then just try focusing on you as a person in those photographs, each one. Take the time to just really look into your eyes at that point. Forget about the event or whatever your location might be, but look into that person at that time. And then she says, take your time to allow yourself to look very objectively. Go past the eyes to the story underneath to the person beneath the surface. Who were you really? And how can you get more in touch with the truth of who you are now? It's a great exercise. I did it. It's getting beneath all the layers of who you identify yourself with, you see. And it can be really, really a spiritual experience. You see, when you wipe away all those layers of who you think you are, it's only one truth. You are the manifestation of your source, an expression of God, a child of God, period. See, when you and I take the time to go deep into our own inner self, it reveals to us also the uniqueness of the people around us. Because we know our interconnection and to each other. So to go a little deeper into Chautauqua's theme this week, building a culture of empathy, we in unity know that meditation and prayer guides us in our own life and with relationships, empathy to others. And so to further elaborate on that, I'd like to introduce my wonderful wife, Amy, of 34 years, and tell you a little bit about her first before she gets into that. She's been a licensed unit teacher for at least 21 years, I believe it is, isn't it? With an emphasis on prayer ministry. She's been an employee of the prayer ministry, and she has led the prayer chaplain program in three of ministries that I've been involved with. And she was a licensed unit teacher representative for 200 unit, licensed unit teachers in the Southeast region for seven years. She knows her stuff about prayer and meditation. And she has some words to us that kind of tie into empathy. We'd like her to do that at this time, if she would. Thank you. Thank you. And what a delight to be here. I'm grateful. 
and just to share a few thoughts, a few thoughts about prayer and empathy. They are kins. <laughs> yes, both have uh, uh, qualities that are parallel tracks with one another. Prayer and empathy, they both create a shift in consciousness, sometimes a paradigm, paradigm shift, dramatic. As we make the shift through prayer and the activity, the conscious activity of empathy, we are able to move away, to drop from the agendas that we often, that often run our lives, the enculturation, the shoulds, the woulds, I could have, all of that stuff, we let go, let go through prayer, through prayer and empathy. Letting go of what? Noise, chaos, negative thinking, negative feelings. And through the process of turning to prayer, to a higher power, a higher intelligence, than that expressing in a particular situation, through that, we become an open door to receive, to receive inspiration, to receive ahas, to receive a greater sense of peace, of sanity. <laughs> in unity, we call that divine order. Prosperity, connections with one another, with neighbors, with friends, with spouses and family members, letting go and receiving something so much, so much more dear. Uh, I have based my grounded, my prayer activity on unity's five basic principles. I'd like to briefly speak about those right now. The first one is one presence, and one power, God in all as all, God good. Secondly, I am, I am naturally, naturally good because God's divinity is in me and in everyone. The third one, I think, therefore I create, I create through my thoughts, my experiences, through what I choose to think, to say, to do, to believe, you remember, you've heard thoughts in mind held after their kind. I pray through prayer, through meditation. I connect with God through spirit, through creator, through source, through divinity. Whatever name you choose, that is the, that the prayer and meditation is the process for that deeper connection to soul to life and through that to the power of freedom and freedom from that which for a, a larger life a more meaningful life and i bring i bring good into my life i pray through affirmative prayer and meditation i connect with god and i live and i do and i give my best the best that i can by living the truth that I know, and I make a difference. As they say in 12-step program, walk your talk. Effective prayer, letting go. Letting go situations, conditions. The high watch, yeah, maintaining the high watch. We, we use that phrase in unity, but it's also sacred space, sacred space, letting go and thereby opening up then to the process of the divine working through us in magnificent ways. Letting go of what we think is appropriate or the best for someone else, simply praying for the highest and the best good, and then letting the prayer be, letting the prayer then manifest in ways that are blessing. Empathy, prayer. It's all about coming from the heart. Yeah. A shift in consciousness. 
And that shift then enables us to experience a, se a sense of respect for others. <laughs> that some, sometimes gets so blocked by uh, st holding strong positions on a variety of life's issues. So much so that we can't listen without agitation, without fear, without rejection. No. Prayer and empathy are the open doors through which we move into a more joyful, richer life. Higher power. Now there is no room for pity. Oh no, no, no. God is as close as hands and feet, as breath. God is the energy that moves through affirmative, what we call affirmative prayer, which is now the cornerstone of prayer in our ministry. And it is a language that is life affirming. It is speaking about now, the divine reality of now, no begging, no begging to a distant God, hoping to influence God with a request perhaps to manipulate certain situations or to change other people. No, that's not what we're talking about with affirmative prayer. No, we're, ta we're not talking about hopeful prayer or, um, it, it, we're, we're, you know, hopeful thinking, wishing. No, that's not it. It's about declarations, declarations of spiritual truth declarations of the nature of God, the divine nature, and our oneness with that nature as spiritual beings. We emphasize being rather than doing in affirmative prayer. And we also, we also take a position of, of moving away from identifying with disease. When we make a statement like, oh, my diabetes, oh, my cancer, oh, no, I couldn't do that, not in my condition. Well, that is very suggestive of uh, perhaps an extreme situation or what, ex what appears extreme, really grabbing hold very tightly the consciousness, the activity of our thinking and our doing. And this kind of thinking, holding on to the negative and the painful, is the opposite of affirmative prayer. So a shift, a shift from identifying with those kinds of things. Henry, I, I ran across something very interesting written by Henry David Thoreau. He wrote, as a single footstep will not make a path on earth, a single thought will not make a pathway in the mind. To make a deeper physical path, we must walk again and again. To make a deep mental path, we must think over and over what kinds of thoughts we wish to dominate our lives. So we say, with affirmative prayer, focus on good, on goodness, surrender. If that's still <laughs> still a frightening thought or one that, is, that you want to reject or can't reject, consider this. Consider a mental diet, one that I think is sure to show some good effect. And the mental diet is this, releasing the worrying about how is my prayer going to be answered? How are things going to work out? No, by that kind of activity, you're like you're like someone who has just planted a seed, longing to see the beautiful flower that's going to emerge. But yes, digging it up, digging up that seed again and again, wanting to know, is it growing? It's counterproductive. So a mental diet then of stopping blame, daily forgiveness of yourself, situations, conditions, forgiveness. Winifred High School Layton is a poet who wrote a, a, a lovely poem about surrender and prayer. And her poem is entitled, A Deeper Root. 
I'd like to read that. When the great oak is battered by wind, the trunk sends down a deeper root to hold steady against the storm. I find the same happens when my soul needs the oak's roots to withstand despair. A deeper root, its name is prayer. Prayer, empathy, open heart, the open heart, the willingness, then allows us to move beyond tolerance to acceptance, to understanding. Today's daily word, which is published by Unity, was on the subject of praying for others. And the biblical reference came from James 5, verse 16. It read, pray for one another so that you may be healed. Prayer and empathy is the, ben is the medicine that the world needs now to heal. Thank you. Well done, Amy, so much, yes. You know, getting back to uh, Nancy Mercurio in her book, she said that the third aspect she talks about is stopping obligatory behavior. <laughs> in other words, we find ourselves sometimes living a life that gets pretty tedious because we tend to do the same old things over and over again. And we get stuck in these ruts, never bring anything new or stimulating into our life. Without realizing it, we easily give up and give away our energy. And we give away our passion for life. Because the same old, same old, you know, we get in these behavior patterns that sometimes finds us working endless hours, doing what we think we have to do or should do, with no or little time for anything else. Other times we get involved in things we normally wouldn't consider because we don't know how to say no. We don't spend enough time alone in the silence, connecting with our inner self because we just can't find the time. So we continue doing a job we hate because we're afraid of giving up the security. We feel constricted. Why, wouldn't it be great to feel free to make decisions that are driven solely by our desires and our passions? To do exactly what we want to do? Well, Nancy says, take the time to write down all those things you do because you feel you have to do and then start gradually replacing them with things you want to do. When you commit to what you enjoy, you know, it gives you personal pleasure. It brings out the best in you. It allows your energy to flow freely. Maybe that's picking up a new hobby, a new job or whatever. And so she says, these three actions alone can begin to allow our light to shine brighter. Number one, believe in yourself. Number two, be yourself. Number three, stop obligatory behavior. There's probably no more significant time than now for each of us who understand who we really are to let our light shine brighter. You fear it's becoming the emotion of the day for a lot of people not only in this world, but right here in our own country. Fear over this pandemic right now, fear over the ups and downs of the economy, fear over countries that are run by dictators, nuclear weapons terrorists, fear of someone who might pick up an automatic rifle and indiscriminately kill, even fear over recent weather patterns climate change, fear of biologically, what we call biological warfare. Just recently ransomware just starting to appear in our history. 
factor of artificial intelligence that may be coming along. And of course, I could go on and on about all kinds of fear because fear can control our lives. And as long as we hold that emotion in our consciousness, we are blocking the flow of good. We're, believe me, there's a lot of blocking going on today. And yet, however, in the midst of all of that, there are also a lot of lights in this world making a difference. And more than we are aware of, more than is acknowledged. Because fear always seems to grab the headlines. Well, the good gets a small print. But no matter the odds, we all have to try harder to let our lights shine brighter. Because it's so badly needed, friends. New thought is unity is known. And our unity principles, our understanding of truth, they're all answers to the challenges in this world. We know that peace lies in that inner wisdom and a spiritual understanding that every one of us on this earth possesses, does possess. We, we all have it, whether we're aware of it or not. You and I share a responsibility to hold our world in a positive, love and light-filled consciousness, shining light for others to see and to do likewise. Remember John Lennon's song called Imagine? Famous song. Well, if a majority of people on this planet were to be a light, is there any doubt that we could and would change the consciousness of the world? And peace would not just be a candle we light at Advent. It could happen. I believe it can. Certainly, maybe not in my lifetime, but as Pierre de Chiron tells us, the evolution of consciousness is the direction of the light. Fear, when placed with truth, can change everything around us. The flow of love and peace takes the place of harm and hurt and violence. With truth, peaceful means are negotiated and are carried out. Oh, you say, but I'm only one person. What difference can I make? I love the story of the old man walking along a shore, a beach where a whole lot of starfish had been washed ashore. And they couldn't get back out into the water. And he would stop and he would pick one up and he would throw it back into the water. And as he was doing that, Young man happened to be walking along the beach, coming toward him, and he saw what he was doing. He said, oh man, what are you doing? He said, there are millions of these starfish all along the shores of this country even. He says, how do you think you are going to make a difference? With that, the old man bent down and he picked up another starfish and he threw it out into the water. He turned to the young man, he said, made a difference to that one. Friends, you and I need to be lights in the world today because it is sorely needed. We are, all of us, spiritual beings on this planet we call Earth, having this human experience. So with that understanding, let's try to live our life every day spiritually, which includes Empathy, be the light. Namaste, peace be with you. Oh, thank you, Ron. Mm -hmm. It's so good to have you back, yes. and good Amy, to be back. Amy, and um, I am going to stop our recording right now.